Okay, we are live. Welcome to the First Impressions Podcast, part three of Persuasion, our discussion of persuasion. I'm Kristen, and I'm joined by Margaret. Hello! <laughs> As always. <laughs> and we're very excited to come back and talk to you about the end of Persuasion, which we didn't quite get to last time. And both of the adaptations, well, you know, I'm sure there's a third one, but uh, the ITV... Uh, 2008, I believe, adaptation, and the Amanda Root, uh, Siren Hines adaptation, the year of which I do not know, and I probably should have looked that up. Oh, isn't it 1995? I'll look um, it up, Kristen. I'm yeah. like the IMDb. Uh, <laughs> IMDb queen. That's my job. I provide color commentary and IMDb searches. <laughs> um, so uh, accordingly, we I have a glass of white wine to talk about the Amanda Root version because I forget if it was on the Facebook page or elsewhere, but someone was telling me, get a glass of white wine and watch the Persuasion adaptation. <laughs> and I have to say, it oh, definitely no, I forgot. I forgot my, my wine, but I probably shouldn't uh -oh. because I'm... I am not still sick from uh, last time, like last time I had a cold, but we had this really weird um, weather happening, and so I'm all congested again for a new and exciting adventure. Yeah, you had um, a snowstorm. So I probably right? shouldn't drink. Yeah, oh my God, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. This um, weather is insane. But you know, climate change isn't real, Kristen. Climate change isn't real. You know, I was just thinking about this this morning that if you, hey, you know, like, it's our podcast. I purposely do not promote this podcast anywhere. If it grows, it grows organically, and, and that's great. But I don't promote it. And part of the reason is I don't want to get too popular because I'm waiting for hate mail. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and I'm just waiting for hate mail. And so I just, I'll just say this, too. Hate me if you want. All right. If you believe that the, the you, you know that a man landed on the moon, okay, that's amazing science. You have a device where you can access all of the world's information in your hand, a smartphone. You can press a button on it; it will ring on the opposite side of the world. Okay, that is incredible and miraculous science. If 97% of client, climate scientists come to you and they say, "Hey, global warming is real and it's man-made," if you don't believe in that, you better have some damn good evidence. Okay, and given the stakes, you better be ready to face your kids in 30 years and say. You know, I didn't believe because I didn't want to. I didn't believe because Rush Limbaugh told me it wasn't real. And, uh, you know, I, it was part of my identity. I was a Republican. Hey, can you blame me? Yeah. Well, they've also if never believed someplace where the air quality is so poor that the populace is told not to go outside today because you might die, you know? Yeah. Well, the, but and there then are they're places like, in oh, the world you know, where it is like that. Now, now they've moved on to like, oh, it's real, but it's not caused by man, but it's right. not caused oh, yeah. by... It's not our fault. It's natural. Yeah. Okay. You better have some damn good... Okay. Back to Jane Austen. Um, Wait, who? No. <laughs> <laughs> we get more Who's and more Jane political. Austen character? Sounds like an uppity woman, if you ask me. <laughs> we get more and more political. Like, okay, how is it possible that thousands of scientists have gotten together and agreed to perp perpetrate this hoax? Nobody becomes a scientist to fake something and get grant money for it, okay? I have a <laughs> science degree. People who get do science Kristen. are interested in seeking truth about the world, Kristen. okay? That is their front. Kristen, what? I love you, but maybe, <laughs> you know, talk about okay. Jane Austen. Jane Austen and climate change. Um, <laughs> No, let's talk about Jane Austen. Let's talk about the end of Persuasion. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, we mentioned the gravel walk last time, which is when um, when Maggie and I and our friend Rachel, who's so also a fan of the podcast. Stroll. We had our romantic stroll. Yeah. yeah, on the gravel walk. And, you know, it's hard to find, but it's a real place. And that's where they go. And so part of the magic of Persuasion in Northanger Abbey, which is not exactly true of the other books, is that you can go to these places. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're physical, real places where we can imagine these characters have actually been. And um, so that's exactly where Anne and Wentworth go. I think we stopped at the letter, right? I think, well, we talked about the, the gravel path because we mentioned that you and I had walked down it. Um, but I yeah, think after they that, that, there is some summing up that happens. Yes, because they go, he comes to the house um, and they talk about whether or not the advice that Lady Russell gave mm -hmm. was right or wrong and how, how, he can, how he can forgive Lady Russell. 
And that's where he sort of gets redeemed. I think for you anyway, you really sort of, for all, all of his, um, you know, bad behavior, he fesses up to how he was wrong. And I think for you that made a lot of it better. Oh, definitely, yeah. I think if it takes – I think it shows a lot of maturity to – I mean, one of the hardest things is to admit when you were wrong, right? Yes, and he's willing to do that, which is sort of the character that she thinks that he has all along. That she knows he has in his heart is this, this, this rigorous character where he's able to evaluate his own actions, at least sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that's incredibly rare and incredibly valuable. And when people are willing to admit that they're wrong, it's to be honest, it's one of the qualities that I value most in people. Um, is to um, Kristen, can actually... I ask you a weird question? Sure. This is a very weird question. But for some reason, it just popped into my head, probably because I've been listening to also a Harry Potter podcast. Do you think what do you think Wentworth is a Hufflepuff? Ah, I think Wentworth has to be a Gryffindor. I mean, the bravery of his, Being in you the know, military, fighting in captain. The war. But, I mean, that would mean there are a heck of a lot of – I mean, I guess there are only four houses, so there would be a heck of a lot of Gryffindors. Yeah. Or probably well, Slytherins and, in the Navy too. I, mean, I don't like know. I feel like you can <laughs> – yeah, but I feel like you can be a military leader and be a Hufflepuff. I don't know. To me, he seems like a Hufflepuff, and everyone knows they're actually the best. Like a hard worker so. and a good friend? He I'm just to doesn't seem – yeah, I mean, just – it's hard to describe because the thing is, as I've been thinking about the houses from Harry Potter a lot, is that kind of their qualities all start to kind of blend into one another. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't want to take us too far down this road because that's a whole other podcast, but I, he comes off as Hufflepuffy to me. Listen, well, so – Feel free to post on the Facebook page if what house you think Captain Hutworth <laughs> should be in. <laughs> well, he's so exceptional, and I don't know. He's got so much personality bursting out of him. I mean, mm, that's is, true. are you allowed well, to be a buff? And be, well, he, he, you know, he's <laughs> he's the life of the party with El Louisa and Henrietta, yeah, and he's I, he's all about being brave, right? Persuasion. He he doesn't like people who can be persuaded. He's all about being brave in his true. own convictions, and that's, an so that's why point. I think Griffin were. I did sort of get the impression, though, that his joviality with Louisa and Henrietta was something of a act. Uh, because yeah, we did right. talk about how he was like being super flirty in front of and be like, hey, girl, look what you missed. And so he was kind of acting more outgoing. Well, he's always been, his heart has always been on his sleeve, right? He's yeah. always, you know, because he, she says that quality of sometimes he says a hasty thing and, and, you know, he, he can judge people who um, say something snobbish or unfeeling. Like when Mary uh, says something like, oh, I haven't been in that house more than twice in my life, I assure you, mm -hmm. when they're talking about Winthrop and he's right. like, uh, a curl of the lip <laughs> or whatever right. that Anne perfectly knew the meaning of. He is so strong in his own convictions of right and wrong. And remember, that's and one of the things that she does not she like about Mr. Elliot is that she has never seen him react like that. Everything is measured. Everything is pre-planned. All of right. his reactions don't seem natural. He's okay. a born Southern, isn't he? Totally. Okay. That just occurred to me <laughs> while we were talking about that. I didn't mean to distract us. We're talking about the end of no, the book. Okay. No, that's all right. Well, um, okay, so they're at the party. Is there anything particular that you wanted to say about what he says at the party? Um, I, I think we could just kind of sum up by saying, you know, she says the advice was good or bad as the occasion, you know, you know, right. as things turned out, as the future brought. Yeah, he could have been mean, killed, she, right? He could have yeah, been could, killed immediately. He could have been captured. He could have just never made it. I mean, she could have been very well given the best adv advice of her life. And I think, too, yeah. this point that I made about Lady Russell having seen the elder Anne Elliot, um, I guess I guess it would have been Elizabeth. El okay, let me take it back. The first Lady Elliot who died, right, Anne's mother, made yes. this sort of young, impetuous, bad marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think someone in – And he, yeah. I mean, that's in, interesting, though, because – he was that she and her Anne's father was 
rich and titled and kind of a jerk. Oh, yeah. So it's so like it's kind of interesting though that she would not be like follow your heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's very yeah. interesting. I think I think that basically he is completely correct when he says, "Look, you never know what's going to happen. You could have ended up giving the best advice. We know now that I'm super rich and fancy and popular that, you know, she should have married me but there's no way to know and like i said i think that shows remarkable maturity on his part to not hold hard feelings also he knows that lady russell is one of Anne's best friends and he wants to bury the hatchet right yeah which is nice of him too which is very big of him too i mean we got to give him you know credit i have to give him credit where credit is due you know and so you know i'm trying to think what happens if anything else happens they get married and then the end of the book is talking about how happy they are and what happens to Mr. Elliot, Kristen? Oh, yeah. So Mr. Elliot, um, it's, it, this is such a good twist, too, in that um, mm-hmm. when Austin talks about, not a twist, but when Austin, Austin talks about the futures of her characters, she sort of like leaves it up like, who knows what will happen for these characters in the future? But he takes Mrs. Clay and um, establishes her in London, sort of like his mistress, um, so that mm-hmm. she can be, she can get her goal, which is to be c- cared for by a wealthy man. She gave up uh, Sir Walter, and um, Mr. Elliot had no reason to hang around Sir Walter and Elizabeth anymore because his goal was achieved of making sure, you know, they wouldn't, he wouldn't marry Mrs. Clay and have a baby and disinherit, you know, uh, um, the title William Elliot. But yes. isn't that crazy? Um, like that to me, how manipulative and plotting to be like this woman could maybe marry this guy and could maybe <laughs> have a son and could maybe make it so I don't inherit. So I'll just make her my mistress. Yes. And, and then- it's, just, it's just like a whoa. If you have any doubt as to whether he was a total douchebag. Yeah, there it is. Know. And. For Mrs. Clay, yeah, and, she kind of gets what she wants. But still, she is nothing but like a chess piece to him, you know? Well, right. And, and, but um, Austin kind of gives a nod to her genius in worming her way into men's hearts by saying it's possible that Mr. Elliot could be wheedled and caressed at last into making her his wife. And so she leaves that door open, and it's sort of funny to think that, yeah, he he may, in the end, she may get the better of him. Oh, that's Um, true. Maybe she will end up getting what she wants, which is to be Lady (laughs) Elliot, right? Yes, yes. Oh, that's crazy. Those two crazy kids deserve each other. To the mortification of Elizabeth, who was this woman who lifted Mrs. Clay up as this poor widow who really had no place in society. Remind me, do we find out whatever happens to Elizabeth? Or is it just kind of like um, she just is, exists? No. We don't ever get a information. Yeah, she's never she never gets married. She's never solicited by that baronet blood that she's looking for. Yeah. Um, That's pretty sad to me. I mean, she is kind of a horrible person, it right? Is. But it I don't know. I mean, back then, is. any woman being like left on the shelf. Well, I think too that you made the point, sad. like, well, why would nobody ever propose to her? She must have been really awful. But the book actually sort of says that she's holding out for a guy who's important enough to suit her. You know, like she thinks her just desserts are to be solicited by another baronet. And there really just aren't that many of them in the world. And That's those true. of them that do exist can afford to make their own choice and maybe don't want her, you know. So um, it's partially of her own doing, I think, yeah, that she true. doesn't, hasn't been married or hasn't, you know. So um, there is space. You know, because. Yeah, there's space that exists between settling and being too picky. Like, just because you don't get everything you want in a potential mate doesn't mean that you're settling. It just means that you're being realistic, right? Right. There is no perfect. But And the other thing, too, I mean, when you look at the situations of these daughters of these great houses, of these grand, I mean, she, when, you know, it's the same situation as, as the Bennets. When Sir Walter dies, she'll be kicked out of the house by the next heir, you know, and she won't be established as the lady of the house anymore. But when you look at what she may have to settle for, I mean, um, uh, Mary Elliot gets married to Charles Musgrove, right? Well, Mary Elliot was living in this grand house at Kellynch. She was the most important woman in the parish. 
And then she marries Charles Musgrove, who has not yet inherited. And she's living in this sort of cottage on the, their yeah. property. And she's no longer the queen bee. And so you really can't sustain that level of importance. You're, you know, a lot of these rich people are born and then have to accept that they're going down in the world. I mean, yeah. at um, woman, Edmund. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it, we even look at Edmund. And yeah. I mean, the second son yeah, that's is true. is grown you know rose raised in this grandeur and has to know the whole time that it's not for him it'll never be his and he's he's just gonna go be a, a clergyman somewhere you know i never thought about it but i think that's probably where mary's hypochondria comes from as well um, oh. as a form of attention because she was always doted upon and yes and you know that she's always taking child. precedence yeah she's always the trying to take so important to her yeah, 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 exactly. She has to, has to be the center of attention and sort of kowtowed to, and then she's not. And I completely agree. Completely. Yeah. You're brilliant insight, Maggie. Well, of course. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I anything else we need to talk about? You know, I the end of the book, the book. Well, and I will just say that, you know, the end of the book is kind of like, um, it ends on a slightly sad note in that they talk about how happy – Anne and Captain Wentworth are with all their friends and everything. But then they talk about how she has to be quick to alarm every time there is an international sort of yeah, that's true. incident that might have to, he might have to go to war. And it, it's sort of like the the lot of um, right. women who marry into the Navy. And that's um, what and like. I remember Jane's brother, one of her brothers yes, was Frank. in the Navy. Right? And I think that's probably because she felt that way. Yes. And she, that's why she could speak realistically about it. And, um, you know, they even lived in, in Portsmouth, you know, which is, and then she writes about that in, uh, right. in um, Mansfield Park. Right. So she, ha she does have all these experiences with these I, with this I think, profession. I think that's very classic Austin to, yes, it's a happy ending, but it's a realistic happy ending. Mm -hmm. Like they get married and they're happy, but, you know, when you are the wife of a naval man, there is always this. And remember, we talked about the shift in tone with persuasion as it was written so much later in her life and how it seemed much more, um, not dark, but, um, well, maybe dark. As you get older, maybe you do right. get more, I don't want to say cynical, but more realistic and just sort of realize that life is a veil of tears or whatever, you know, and, and um, yeah, you know, yeah, the rose-colored glasses come off. Yeah, they really do. You, you become a little bit more understanding of of all the tragedy that could possibly befall you in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, yeah. So, and you know, I think one thing that's interesting about Austen's books is I sometimes I puzzle over why she ends them the way that she does. I mean, I think what's interesting about Pride and Prejudice is sort of that it ends on a mention of the gardeners, like you know, like. They had been the, mean, the means of uniting them. And that's like kind of the last sentence of that, just talking about the gardeners. And there's got to be a reason, but I don't know that I can put my finger on it. And um, now I'm trying to think best. how Emmett ends. And I because can't even think about the Emmett. They're actually the best. <laughs> they, they, Yeah, we like focus on how they're great people. And, you know, those are the, the valuable people that, you know. But I, I'm trying to think. I can't even remember. You know, and Austin is famous for these like great opening lines. But Maybe not necessarily do... for her last line. I need to start writing down all these ideas I have because I mentioned them in the podcast and then they immediately fly out of my mind. But I think actually a good future topic could be let's look at the beginning of every book and let's look at the end of every book. Oh, that would be fascinating. So Yeah, well thank you, Chris. Good idea. Write it down. Um, okay, hang on. I'll get up and get a pen and write it down. I'm serious. I'm <laughs> okay, <laughs> do it. Do it. Because I don't want to forget that. I can't go too far from the computer, though, because I'm plugged in with my headphones. And it would be, right. um, it would be like that scene in my Big Fat Greek Wedding where she tries to walk away from the phone. <laughs> and it's like, Wah! and she goes, boom. <laughs> that would be a great movie. You should make Bay do it. Oh, that's a good idea. Bay! <laughs> oh, Bay! He's not coming when I call him. Oh, here he comes. Darling, would you be so kind as to get me the steno pad that's on the desk over there, please? I, oh, he's sticking his tongue out at me. I can't get up because I'm tethered. Unfortunately, he's actually wearing pants. 
<laughs> Only the classiest here at Casa Riley. All right. Future podcast ideas. He just threw his pants <laughs> at me. <laughs> okay. Beginning and ends. All right. So, Kristen, what is next on today's so docket? On today's docket, let's move into talking about the two adaptations of persuasion that we you know, mentioned we were going to talk about. The yes. first being um, uh, a version made by ITV, if I'm not mistaken, which I I thought it was a BBC, but I guess that's slightly different. I don't know. It's kind of like um, – so my understanding of the way the British television works when I lived there is BBC is, you know, obviously government – funded um kind of like public broadcast right but there are pres there are prescription subscription channels like sky tv and things like that that produce their own content and i believe itv is one of them don't quote me on that and don't send me mean emails if i'm wrong but that's kind of my understanding of how it works so it would be like hbo or you know one of those um other channels yeah so both of us just watched this adaptation very recently and I guess we should start by summing up our major impressions. So Maggie, do you think first? Oh, no. Now, before we talk about that, because you got on my case about um, being too mean uh, to people who adapt, you know, to, to these pieces of art that we have valid criticisms about, but, you know, people try to make art. We appreciate that, you know, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying if you enjoy this adaptation, that's great. Like, I'm. That's great. Get your no, own podcast and talk about it. Let's be real, no, Maggie. Me. No, I, it, I do not respond. I did not respond well to it. Actually, the first time Kristen and I watched it was when it aired on um, Masterpiece when they were doing all of the recent – so it was right after it was made, very soon. We watched it in your living room, mm -hmm. and I had not read the book. So I just came into the movie, and I just even then remember thinking – it's just the direction of it to me makes no sense. Boy, Wolf, like, I, I don't know that anybody has this as their favorite persuasion adaptation because there, there are some major problems. Let me fit, first say that the score is a major problem. All right, the music is beautiful, but it's so loud and overbearing and so sad and so... Oh, I didn't even notice that. Oh, it's I relentless. was too distracted by the shaky cam, quick cuts and yeah. face close-ups. You know what it reminded – oh, my gosh. You know what it actually reminds me of? The new Les what? Mis they made where oh, really? it was like the super close-up on everyone's face when they were singing. Yeah. Yeah. You hated that, Les Mis. Oh, yeah. Oh, shocking enough, right? Because it's the exact same as <laughs> – no. Look, it's not a bad movie, okay? I just don't respond to the aesthetic they were going for. Um, they felt much the same way. Um, well, I got to tell you, too, the performances were a real problem. I'm not saying these people are bad actors, necessarily. But the first thing that was bad about the performances is some people come to Austin and they, they have the, the need to do a certain accent. And, um, oh, ha, 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 we are so British. Oh, you know, yeah. like I know British people speak with a British accent, but they way overdo it and, 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 um, try to sound period where, without really sounding natural. So, and a lot of the laughter I felt like was felt really forced to me, especially in the beginning where they introduce uh, Henrietta Louisa and they have to be like, oh, we're so young and fun. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of that was probably a deliberate choice by the director because you want to show how frivolous everyone seems to be compared to Anne. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And it's sort of like told through very clearly through her lens. But Speaking a lot let, of me, the, let me just say that I love Anthony Stewart Head because of Buffy, right? Yeah. He was amazing on Buffy. I think he's an amazing actor, and I hated him in this. Who was he? He played Sir Walter. Really? Yeah. I just watched this thing, and it, I did see Anthony Head in the credits, but I thought it w must not be him because it didn't say Anthony Stewart Head, and I knew that's what he was. Oh, he, yeah, after Buffy, he went back to just being Anthony Head. Um, you know, part of the reason is I that I, I, could, you, I, oh. I couldn't find it's this hard. on Amazon or Hulu or whatever. I had to watch it on some random, it wasn't even YouTube, and I got the quality was so bad that I couldn't even really see the people's faces that well. So I think that's why I didn't recognize them. But that's, uh, wow. Well, and a lot of the performances were so flat. 
um, a lot of the deliveries were monotone. They weren't animated. And that was going to the fact that like, oh, it's supposed to be a somber tone. But yeah. um, it did feel like that's the, not everything the was gray. So gray, everything was gray. Right? Everything was bland and sort of blank. And I, I guess, I mean, as you said, I think that was a conscious choice because we're supposed yeah. to feel, but we're not supposed to feel relentlessly sad throughout this whole yeah. story. Yeah, we no, are I totally agree. To feel the life and the fun um, to a certain extent of the characters and they're supposed to be uh, personable and they're supposed to have their own personas. I mean, Anne, you know, and and we can um, we can talk about Anne and her portrayal too, but I, that was what made it so hard for me is that nobody was fleshed out and yeah. in living color. And so it wasn't fun, you know, and we spent yeah, all this time just... Good. To me, and yes, Anne has regret in her life, but she is not an unhappy person. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that she ha harbors a pain and unhappiness in her her soul. But yes. I think her, she's also extremely strong and is yeah. always trying to um, just take comfort in her duty and the knowledge she's done her duty, take comfort in um, what she can, which to be fair is scant. Uh, you know, but for example, loving the little boys and the little yes, muscles, her nephews, you know. and she loves Lady Russell. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. And when she sees Mrs. Smith, she's completely happy about chatting with her and catching up. Um, I don't know. I just felt that adaptation did real disservice to the novel. To, to Anne, yeah, she's uh, she she has a source of inner strength, which um, which is Sally Hawkins. <laughs> is that the name of the... Sorry. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm coughing. I'm sorry. Um, I don't remember. I'll look it up. You think it's Sally? Um, Sally. Oh, so. <coughs> 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 sorry, Kristen. No, it's okay. Um, I will look it up. I thought that she was fine. Bay, his response to her was, quote, she's a babe. <laughs> um, I found that really shocking. I mean, she's not unattractive. Don't get me wrong, but that character it's not supposed to you're I, not supposed to feel i was just track. like are you high right now like i did not that was very they strange do a lot to me of, that he would be like oh yeah she's hot i'm like okay uh now i'm questioning my own <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, sally hawkins and let me tell you that in real life sally hawkins is completely lovely i mean she but they just made her look in that production. I don't know. It just really sad the all the time, I guess. Was, well, yeah, exactly. I didn't think the problem was necessarily her, her look, but they always had this opportunity for her to turn away and look devastated. Or when they go to Winthrop, she has to like just leave me and like she cry. Juan, you know, yeah, Juan, and she's always crying, and mm -hmm. that's not. Anne Elliot has this inner strength, but was as we go along, one of the reasons we love her so much is her stiff upper lip and her determination to go on and put on this face the world like, you know, being in company with with Captain Wentworth is a mere nothing, you know. And yeah. um, Anne Elliot is very British. She very yeah, much and it's not that we can British never spirit. see her. It's not that we can never see her sad. I'm not saying we can never see her suffer, but this was like all suffering. It was the psychological torture. Like that was the whole point of it. That's all we saw. That's all we got. And um, that was, uh, it wasn't great. I just, the direction to me, those, the shaky handheld camera, the, it, it alternated between shaky handheld quick cuts and then also some long tracking shots especially that first kind of shot and where it follows Anne through the house. Yeah. They just, didn't, you know, is that, that made no, that sequence was like, it made no sense to me. I felt like it didn't portray, it didn't give the audience any information. It was like three minutes of just following her. Yes. Yeah. They're packing and it's a grand house. Got it. Yeah. You don't, uh, it, there were just decisions in that, that were inexplicable to me. If you want to mount a defense of the 2007 adaptation, we would love to read it. And like we said, you know, we don't want to, crap all over something that you enjoy we just neither of us responded to that movie but I, I um, think it's because part of the well I don't know I, we saw the Amanda Root at least I saw the Amanda Root adaptation first and part of it was that I had expectations for the way that it should be mm. perhaps 
and was disappointed. But um, truly, I think if I had seen this movie with no reading of the book, with no having seen the other adaptation, I don't think I would have responded to it. I just can't. It was relentlessly sad. And yeah, ooh, I did me. like the Captain Wentworth, though. I thought he was pretty good. He was dreamy. Yeah. Right? He, well, he was a <laughs> really mean and he never showed any like lightheartedness either. And they had th these weird exchanges, especially between him and Captain Harville, who are supposed to be friends. And they had these weird tense ex exchanges where they're almost yelling at each other about mm -hmm. whether or not he's betrothed to Louisa or people think that, you know, he's it, honor pledged to Louisa and the delivery that um, and sort of mean and, 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 and he's so mean to Anne at the beginning where he's sitting there at the Musgroves and she's there and he's like, I only want a woman of strong. You, oh, they yeah. take the, they take the dialogue that, uh, he says to Louisa and, and overhears and they put it direct so that Anne yeah. is sort of the target of it. And it is way mean. I mean, it is very pointed and he, you know, he almost never smiles. I, I just feel like I'm not a, not that thrilled about her and him and don't necessarily understand why she's so into him. Well, he is um, hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I say something too? Just This is a little thing, but in both adaptations, it starts with the servants putting blankets over the furniture, which doesn't make sense to me because the Crofts are coming to inhabit the house and will be using the furniture. Yeah, I wondered about that too. Maybe it's just kind of like a politeness thing, like let them feel like Maybe they're, they're coming into were they kind of an almost blank space. I don't know. Were they closing up a wing of the house? Because that's the only thing that would Maybe. make, like Beauty and the Beast style. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing, though. If you're going to do that, make it clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, the audience shouldn't be caught up in details like that. Yeah. Well, maybe I was just, watching maybe movie. I just know too much, you know, maybe a normal and a, probably a normal viewer wouldn't think that much of it. I thought you were going to say normal person. I'm like, Kristen, you're normal ish. We have to talk too <laughs> about, oh, thank you. I'm not that normal. <laughs> we have to talk too about the decision which was made um, to the way the letter was done. Oh God. Oh, so awful. I, I was so surprised that they took the dialogue between her and Harville and gave it to Benick, first of all, I believe, and then made it unlistened to by Wentworth. So they have this the running. exchange. And the running. No, we have – it's just the running. Well, that they didn't do the whole thing. runs all over Bath. It makes – Bob, it makes no sense. Yeah. Is it supposed to be building tension because really it was just – it so just makes much me running. seasick, and it's ridiculous. She she runs one place, and they're like, oh, no, you just missed him. He's over there. And she runs the other place. Oh, no, you just – and it's just like, what? I remember watching with Bay, and I hadn't said anything. I didn't want to inform his opinion. I didn't, I didn't want to inform my opinion. I tried to come into it. You know, it had been almost 10 years since I'd watched the movie. But he looked at me, and he said, what is with the running? It That's just one of the out. things I it remembered about no this sense. It makes it was no yeah. sense. And you know she's going to catch up to him because she gave – at this point, or at a certain point, she's read the letter and knows that she wants he wants to marry her. So they're definitely going to catch up at some point. So, I, I mean, I get, oh, it's so dramatic. Oh, and the other weird thing is that she's running, 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 and um, uh, uh, Mrs. Smith – like runs up beside her and she's like, I'm going to tell you about Mr. Know, Elliot. So they just disabled. Like what is happening? Yeah, they Why is away. everyone running around bath? It's just, yeah. They had to wedge it in uh, it, like right at the end. They're like, Oh, nobody cares to see the scene where this disclosure is made. So they just like wedged it in while she's running around. And there's um, like this exposition, right? Where they're both running and she's shouting yeah. exposition at her. It's yeah. Just, so the only thing I can think of is the director was saying, okay, so Anne at this moment, her whole mind is in turmoil. Her whole mind is racing. So let's have her race through Bath. And then when she catches up with Wentworth, everything will stop. <laughs> yeah. And, and then it's the two of them. And the problem with that is it sounds great. But when you literally just have a camera following around an actress running for five minutes. It took too long. It was too long. It's awful. And okay, let's talk about probably one of the worst <laughs> kisses on film I have ever seen in my entire life. I don't 
first of all, he's a jerk. Just bend down and kiss her. Like she's trying to reach your face and she's trying to basically chew your face off. Is this persuasion in zombies? I don't know because she looks like she's trying to bite his face off. This is one of the problems I have with a lot of Austin adaptations is directors are like, okay, they're super versions. They've never kissed before. It's got to be the most awkward. They got to be scared of it. They got to be like, not sure how it's going to work. And so it's got to be excruciatingly awkward. They sort of did it in the Gwyneth Paltrow, Jeremy North and Emma too, where they're like, uh, 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 uh. That was just like a little like kind of tentative, but this was like, she's hanging up there trying to reach his lips, her mouth working. (laughs) It was so oh, just, Yeah, even Bay was like, this is awful. And <laughs> I just I can't see any again, if you really if you think that's a beautiful first kiss, I'm really sorry. I don't mean to say this to say that you're you know, that your opinion is wrong, but for me, I just don't see that as a romantic well, end. It's just well, uh, it's perplexing. It's- Thing, if all had gone well with the director's intentions, I think we would have been so wound up and so uh, passionate and desiring at that moment that drawing out the kiss would have been this exquisite agony of, oh my God, they're going to kiss. But that's you know, not what happened. I don't mind the drawing out, but the fact that she's working her mouth yeah. up oh, and oh, down oh. makes it <laughs> weird, right? It's yeah. not just me, is it? No, it's not just you. First time I kissed a guy, I like kissed his nose on accident. Aww. We were in a dark tunnel. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of awkward first kisses, but you're making a movie. Should be movie so magic cute. here. You I know. don't even remember my first kiss. I honestly what? don't. I know. You know I don't remember. Was with? Nope. What? That's crazy times. Crazy no, talk. Really don't. Yeah. My memory for <laughs> my younger days is very poor. Well, that's okay. Now people are going to think I'm like an amnesia. Um, no, it's, I, it's, I really can't. I just don't really remember. Sorry. I know these are supposed to be big, important <laughs> moments, but whatever. <laughs> well, and I think you, you only think it's a big, important moment when, because you're told so. And you're just like, oh, my first kiss. But if no one had told me that, I probably wouldn't have necessarily. Yeah, that's true. I remember almost all the memory, books like, I read when I was younger. I could remember all those, <laughs> all the books because those were important. <laughs> yeah, all the Encyclopedia mm-hmm. Brown and stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I wasn't like eight when I had my first kiss. That'd oh. be weird. Anyway, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that then it was 1995, by the way. Or no, we're talking about the 2007. Sorry. I think it's safe to say that the 2007 persuasion is not something that Kristen and I enjoyed particularly. A swing and a miss. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I, I think people people understand what we're, we're trying to be object. You know, we're just voicing our particular problems with particular problems with it. Um, yeah. What else do we need to say about it? I I am trying to Maybe think. Um, it, it, was it the case yeah. that when you and I watched it together and Louisa fell that we actually laughed? Oh my God! You erupted into gales of laughter and I just remember kind because of, I hadn't you know you find that particular passage in the book hilarious anyway she was oh, by oh, half yeah. or whatever um yeah. and I had not read the book at that point and I remember you just like fell off the couch <laughs> and I had to rewind it and watch it and I was like Kristen I mean yeah it's kind of silly but she fell and busted her head and you were just like cracking up Oh, sorry. I guess I knew it was fake and fictional and laughing at the perhaps artistic lack of um, oh conveying. Oh, my God. So, sorry. <laughs> I am now reading the IMD trivia, and I totally forgot that the guy who plays Mr. Elliot is um, Tobias Men- uh, Menzies, who is in, like, Rome and Game of Thrones and Outlander and he's amazing and made zero impression. Oh, yeah. See, so that, that's the problem is that the actors are <clears throat> not allowed to come out because they were forced to be so flat. There's a lot of information on IMDb about the gowns worn in this movie. That oh, is what the right. trivia is. That's, that's what's so important. I so did like that velvet collar that she's in. This is literally all what? about the clothing, which I'm not sure if that – says anything okay like everything is about the dresses whatever uh uninteresting 
Yeah, sorry, just not something that we responded to. Well, and that's okay. And so we can turn on a happier note, if unless you have anything else to say about it, to the no, no, Amanda no. Let's talk about the other one. Yeah, the Amanda Root. I'm um, I just, I just keep calling it the Amanda Root version. But it's, um, how right. do you say his names? Is it Siren? Siren? Oh, Hines? was I supposed to find that out? Uh, I don't know. I should. I just now thought I'm going to talk. I'm going to say his name out loud. I should know how Here's to pronounce do. it. Please hold. <laughs> How do you pronounce Syrian <laughs> Hines? It's totally an ethic pre programmed Google. Uh, okay. I don't hear Karen it. Hines. Kieran. Maybe. Kieran. It's Welsh. It's Welsh, which is basically impossible to pronounce anyway. I had no um, idea. Yeah, people have put this on YouTube. Kieran it, uh, Hines. Yeah. Kieran. So, so Kieran let's just Hines. go with Kieran Hines. If we're wrong, we apologize. YouTube says it's Kieran. Um, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Yes. So Amanda Root, Kieran Hines, 1995. Highly recommended, I think it's fair so to good. say. Oh, my gosh. So I basically had okay. the opposite experience as you did. You had seen this one first before the 2007, so you had high expectations. I saw this one recently after the 2007 and had very low expectations. But I loved it! <laughs> I didn't like it at but when I saw it like 10 years ago, and I, I couldn't even tell you now why I, I didn't because – I have watched it now, you know, recently, obviously, and really did like it. And I have to say, first off, let me just say, uh, Kieran Hines' performance really helped me uh, picture, understand, empathize with, sympathize with uh, Wentworth. Mm -hmm. Far better than I, I did with everything the book. I've seen him in. But I'd never seen him really, other than Jane Eyre, when, I mean, let's be honest, Rochester is kind of a dick. Um, yeah. I've never seen him as kind of a romantic leading man, but he he was great. He was great, and he was great. Everything about this movie, I loved. I liked everything about this movie. I thought it was in great. the way that he um, portrayed Wentworth as a man of uh, deep character, lively character. Um, that dinner scene where they're all together, and he's talking mm -hmm. about yeah. um, how he would never have a woman on his ship. You know, he's funny, he's outgoing, and clearly feels deeply and um you know there's this exchange where they talk about the year six and he the sort asp. of when he the asp. For the asp and he's like well i was anxious to get to see and admiral croft is like well if you didn't have a wife of course you were and he's sort of like yes but i had no wife in the year six yeah. and sort of looks at her significantly which is a do still i still think it's kind of mean However, I think his pain is apparent um, to yeah. a certain extent. And it did. I did connect with that better than I did with the book Wentworth. I could see who he was. I could see per his personality. And I really thought he was an embodiment, a great embodiment of the character. So I actually watched this one twice in the last week because I liked it so much. <laughs> and something I noticed, which I thought was a beautiful acting choice that he made was when you could when Wentworth was thinking about it consciously he did not make eye contact with Anne yes he would just not look at her or he would maybe look at her forehead I mean you could tell that he was he was looking at her but not at her never met her but eyes. then the times when he would kind of forget or obviously at the end then he would look her directly in the eyes and it was subtle but it was so i thought it was so beautiful i he I was, was willing great. to engage with her as a person or felt in that moment that she had personhood whereas he when he was conscious he was trying to deny her the, the her value as a person so to i think it was more like it was too painful to look at her oh i didn't see it as him kind of de -human, not humanizing her or anything like that but because it was so hard for him to look at her because he was hurt so badly still 
Mm. Yeah, but I, th I think he was still sort of try kind of trying to punish her, especially in that first scene where he comes in to see Mary and is like um, knowing that he's seeing her for the first time in eight years, mm -hmm. you, you know, and he doesn't look at her at all. And I thought that was sort of pointedly intentionally trying to show her mm. how little he cared. Um, oh, which interesting. Is See, to me, it was just kind of like he didn't – it would be so – hurtful and awkward if he did um, and so that's why he was trying to play it cool but i mean the, your i don't disagree with your interpretation either i think it's just kind of we both saw different things in the performance which to well, me shows a depth of the performance y yes yes well and of course i just assume he's being you know because of the way i feel the character feel about the character kind of have a i'm inclined to look at his behavior as negatively as possible no, that's a great point. You look at him as being just kind of a jerk through a lot of the film um, and book. And to me, it's more that he is still so full of hurt that that's kind of the lens I see it through. So I think that our interpretations are both valid and just kind of depend on how we view Wentworth from the book. Let's talk about um, the, the Marys. We can compare the two Marys. And honestly, um, so Sophie uh, Thompson, Emma Thompson's sister, who also played Miss Bates, um, is uh, plays Mary Musgrove in the Amanda Root version. Oh, she's and so good. She's so good. She was excellent at playing the character. It's still such an annoying character that, you know, sometimes it does great, but that's what she's supposed to be making right. you feel. And she's so funny. Um, a lot of the times the comedy does come across and her hypochondria does seem funny. And um, I thought she was great. And what's funny about the ITV adaptation is the woman they got sort of even looks like her. They styled her the same way. And she has a similar delivery, but it was much flatter. Yeah. And I didn't feel that the character had a, a whole lot of comic heft or comic like um, delivery. But, you know, with, with someone as talented as Mafalda Hopkirk, um, we really, uh, the most really British got... name ever. Oh, um, is that <laughs> more British than Crispin Bonham Carter? Bonham Carter I don't know. No, Crispin Bonham Carter is more British. Yeah, that's true. But Mathilda Hop Hopkirk also yeah. sounds like <laughs> a Harry Potter mm -hmm. name, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it does. And as you mentioned, Aunt Petunia is, um, oh um, my craft. God, let me just say when <laughs> she popped in as Mrs. Croft, I yelled at my television. It's like, I freaked out. I was watching it by myself, and I yelled <laughs> at the television. And see here, that this is the perfect example of there are no small parts, there are only small, small actors. Because she only had a handful of lines, right? But that character was fully realized, amazing. What That scene where um, Wentworth says, no, I would never want a woman on the ship, blah, blah. And she was like, I'm sorry. I've lived on five ships. We are not, you know, when you talk as if all women are delicate, whatever she said. But she was so good. She was so good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I loved her. Oh, my gosh. I just – I loved all the performances in this movie. I thought – so one of the things I loved the most about this movie was actually the script. They left in a lot of small moments from the book that you could easily cut. Um the scene at Upper Cross where everyone is bitching to Anne <laughs> yep. about each other. Yep. But they leave that in and you learn so much about those characters and you learn so much about Anne. Yep. She passively listens. She always listens. She passively listens. But you notice that none of them are actually talking to her. They're talking at her. Yeah. <laughs> and when people talk at her, she just kind of sits there and listens. But when people talk to her, Amanda Root makes Anne kind of come alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I could just go on and on and on. I love this movie. and But the script left in these moments that let the characters and the story breathe, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it made everyone and the world and all the things feel so real. This version, actually, this adaptation and the Northanger Abbey, which are both have substantially take place in Bath. I don't think it's a coincidence. But they both, to me, feel the most real of any that I've seen. Those they look did, like real people um, in a real Regency town interacting with one another in a real way. 
This is um, bouncing around a little bit, but what did you think of the decision when they finally do come to an understanding of having like the parade, like the circus? Something? Okay, so that I remember the first time I was watching it, I was like, and now there's a random circus. <laughs> okay. But then as soon as I started thinking that, I thought, no, this is perfect because it shows that the world they live to them this world is full of the ridiculous and the loud and the crazy and these two people on the street they have this intimate moment and then they turn around and walk the other direction i and i, I thought that maybe agree. they lingered too long on the parade after they had left because <laughs> i guess if you're gonna have a big set piece like that you want to show yeah. it but yeah, i absolutely yeah. understood what they were saying it was like look at all of this insanity going on around them but these two people that is all they care about yeah, that was 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 beautiful and also kind of dreamlike. Yeah, um, which I appreciated. But Would once they got together in the like world, that? um, it kind of took me really? out of the story for a minute because I was just thinking back then. Would you have a guy and a girl just go for it? And I thought that kiss was beautiful, by the way. Um, but it did seem strange that they would just kiss in public. I didn't know if that would be seen as scandalous. They're like sort of at the age where they, they don't care anymore. It's so momentous. And they're them. now engaged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, if it was scandalous, that would, there would be like no actual, like, while well, they're getting married. Um, But I don't know. I don't really know. But yeah. I didn't stop to think about it. I, for whatever reason, but I, I think that's a good point that it was probably a pretty unusual thing to do. What did you think of the parade? Did you think that was weird? Um, I did. I thought it was, had a beautiful dreamlike quality to it. Yeah. I also kind of, I think you're right that they lingered too long on it because I started to find it slightly creepy and grotesque yeah. almost. Well, you know, parades and circuses. and But that's kind of how Anne views Both anyway, right? Oh, yeah, it's true. That's true. That to her, it's just posturing and people dressing up as brightly as they can and trying to impress one another and being yes. loud. and So to her, but that's not who she and Wentworth are. And amongst all that, they do sort of retire yeah. into their own little world. Oh, there's this great moment. And I just, I, I can't remember seeing Amanda Root in anything um, other than this. I've looked up her, you know, her filmography and I've seen movies that she's in, but I didn't, don't really remember. But she just blew me away in this. There's this beautiful moment after they kiss where she runs her hand along his arm of his coat and then moves her hand into his, so he's then like escorting her through the street. You know, she's mm. he's taken her arm, kind of thing, or she's taken his mm. arm. And it was oh, it was so intimate and beautiful. And oh, I just love it. <laughs> I really liked this movie. I like I said, I watched it multiple times. I really, really liked it. There's another sort of parade too, while they're a different kind, where they're in the pump room. If I'm not mistaken, they just sort of like are walking around in a circle. Oh, yeah, that's true. That, that is, but I mean, and that's, that is that's, how the pump room looks now. Like, this is the thing. They're very aided when the Jane Austen adaptations are in Bath. They're very much aided by the fact that it looks a lot like it did. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to just send someone out into the, I mean, you know, you were there. Yeah, yeah. And the formality of that and the um, uh, pomp of that, mm -hmm. I, I probably con contributes to what you were saying is the artificiality of, of Bath and of uh, Mr. Elliot, you know, in that setting, um, you know, he, they have that conversation about what's good company and it sort of enhances or, or reinforces it artificiality. By the way, I thought he was pretty darn good looking. Am I just weird or was he good looking? Kieran Hines? No. Wait, um, Mr. Mr. Elliot? Sorry, your voice went out for a second, so I didn't actually hear Oh, you sorry. Said. Yeah, no, this Mr. Elliot guy. He was not unattractive. Yeah. But I, and, um, that. I would not cast someone who was unattractive in that role because the whole point of Mr. Elliot is that you find out that it's all a facade. Yes, you know, so you're right. want him to be seen as a potential. And he came off as very romantic, I thought. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, he was quite plausible. And I think they made a really smart choice. They made the really smart choice of making it so Mrs. Smith and Nurse Rook just found out 
<laughs> yes. That Mr. Elliot was actually had lost his money and that's why he brought himself back in to Sir Walter's orbit. Um, I think it's really smart in the book to make it a little more sneaky. He wants the title. He has his own money. You know, Mrs. Smith becomes a much more complicated character because she kind of sat on that information about her own circumstances. But for the purposes right. of the movie, at that point, we're rocketing towards the end. We're focusing yeah, on the to love story. That, to, to streamline yeah. that was a good choice. It, it, it would have just was, been too yeah. overly it would have just been too overly complex otherwise. Yeah. For a book, when you have all of these other opportunities um, for subplots and, you know, um, to have it be more of a scheme and to get into the nitty gritty of why he's an awful person and all of these things that he did to her personally, like, that's that's great. Let's do it. But in a movie, you you got to, like, pick your battles. Um, mm -hmm. And I yeah. thought that was a really smart. Why didn't you tell me this before? We just learned of it. I'm like, okay, yeah, great. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a very short scene not, too. And Mrs. Smith, I thought was also did a fantastic job. The actress who played her, I thought she was great. And you know, Anne even says, you know, you seem so happy. You're not melancholy. And she's like, oh no, you know, I've got everything I need. And this book gives me my favorite thing, the gossip. I just felt like the choices yeah. they made for the adaptation were really smart. Um, I wanted to say too. Oh man, now I forgot. Oh, oh, we had to talk too uh, about in both adaptations. They took um, something that happens in the canceled chapters of Persuasion, Ooh. which is the the um, the big uh, sort of right before they get together. The thing that precipitates their you know declarations of love is that both of them come to Anne and they're like, we hear you're getting married to Mr. Elliot. You can live in Kellynch if you want. The Admiral yeah, told me to tell that's you. right. Which is, um, you know, they, they, they thought that was romantic for whatever reason. They wanted to include that. But what really would have happened in those situations is that it would have precipitated this declaration of love, the way Austin actually wrote it. Because Wentworth would have figured out from her answer that, you know, she and Elliot were not engaged. And <coughs> Sorry. Bless you. She, she and Elliot were not engaged and immediately say, will you marry me and I love you? But it's okay. It, the weird, what I found weird in the Amanda Root adaptation is he comes to her and he's all, he's doing his dramatic Wentworth thing, um, which super does. Super formal. Super. Su I, well, I thought super, he, that was really good, right? Again, looking at her forehead, not looking at her eyes. Because it and was obviously so awful. all worked up, obviously all worked up and 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 you know hot and bothered about it, flustered about it. Um, mm -hmm. And rather than saying, "Dude, I don't love Mr. Elliot," Amanda Rouge just goes, "Why does everyone assume?" And but then, then run away. Interrupted. No, doesn't Miss doesn't Lady Russell come over to her and it's like, "You got to come over here right now," and like basically pulls her away. Well, no. Well, yeah, I think that happens, but. I, it did not come up. I mean, yes, as a modern viewer, I'm like, girl, just tell him. Yeah. But as a for the purposes of the movie, her being like, why does everybody think? And then being interrupted, I I thought it was fine. It didn't bother me. Okay. It it did kind of bother me. Yeah. But you know what? That's probably why. And that's also like you were saying. It's back to that thing that Jane Austen does so well, where she doesn't fall into the sitcom -y misunderstanding uh. plot movement. And that was a choice the filmmakers made. So, mm -hmm. that as a flog, I kind of lay it there. I mean, that's not at Austen's feet, that's at their feet no. for putting that no. in. Um, no. And like you said, she would just say, oh, oh, no, I'm not marrying Mr. Elliot. I still love you. And then you he's know, like, I still love you too. It, um, it, one thing we didn't talk about, and I wish I had mentioned it, is when we were talking about the end of the book, one thing that, um, one line that I really loved, stop me if I talked about this before, but Anne is sort of assured by Wentworth that she's still just as lovely as before. Mm -hmm. And he says something like, little, you know, little could you know that to my eyes you could never alter. When really she remembers what he said at the beginning, like I've never seen someone so altered as she, I would not right. have known her again. And she thinks to herself, or she's really glad to know that his admiration of her beauty is sort of an effect of him falling back in love with her rather than the cause. 
because he yeah. didn't see her as beautiful when he came back to see her again for the first time. I and always then, thought him saying that he'd never seen someone so altered was because he was just lying and being a jerk. Well, yeah. Well, and he in the book it says he spoke as he felt without any thought of it getting back to, to Anne. So it seems like it was one of those things he said off the cuff. Um and, so, you know, sometimes when you remember yeah. someone in your memory and you see them again, you're like, oh, wow, the, the, you know, the years have changed them. It doesn't necessarily mean you find them or you or will it's one find of those them. things that he told point. himself. Yes. Also. Yes, 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 exactly. Like, oh, yeah. You know how we tell ourselves the narrative. Like, if you run into your ex-boyfriend, like, he might objectively still be really cute. But you're going to be like, oh, he looks like shit. But, you know? And- yeah. So that you feel better. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Typical Wentworth. But one of no, the things that <laughs> in the canceled chapters, yeah, it is. Um, in the canceled chapters that it that the she leaves him with the assurance that she had gained in personal beauty. That's the way Austin wrote it the first time. What does that mean? And it becomes much more realistic in the second ending that she wrote where it's um, just like, to my eyes, you can never alter, you know, um, rather than being like, and you're twice as beautiful as you were before. You know, what you know like, to me, that's so romantic. Like, as a woman, you know, I know, any one of our listeners who is a woman knows our self-worth is not wrapped up in our appearance. And objectively, we know that. But subjectively, we are constantly – wondering if we are attractive enough, right? I mean, right. I'm just dropping truth bombs here. If you t- ask, if you like, Margaret, is your self-worth wrapped up in your appearance? Absolutely not. I'm a person. I am worthy no matter what I look like. But I still sometimes catch a glimpse of myself and I'll be like, oh, blah, blah, negative thought. And then I get upset about it. So when when I'm like, oh, I feel gross, I feel fat, which we shouldn't do, but we still do, and Babe will be like, yeah, you're beautiful. I love you no matter what you look like. And I know he means it. It is so romantic. So I think it Wentworth is. saying that is just and – him, and I believe him. Oh, it's so, <laughs> it's so romantic. Like yeah. even when you are old and shriveled and, you know, 90, I will still think you are beautiful. It's just like, oh, my God. There is that scene too in the Amanda Root version where after Mary drops that bomb, what, Captain Wentworth was not very gallant by you, Anne. Gosh, she's mm-hmm. a bitch. There's that yeah. scene where Amanda Root is sitting in front of the mirror and sort of. <gasps> oh, is yes. Oh, my God. Face. I love that. That was something I caught the second viewing where Mary drops that and she's just like, oh. And then they just show her kind of staring at herself and looking just like at wrinkles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. That was. Oh, that was such a great moment because we've all done that, right? Right. <laughs> it felt, no, it felt so true to me. And it she didn't so even – there was no dialogue. There was nothing. Just Amanda Root looking in a mirror and you knew exactly what she was thinking. Yeah. You knew exactly yeah. how she felt and exactly how she was feeling and how that hurt. And I, I thought it was so well done. So well done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just really loved this movie. And I didn't expect to. It, the pace was kind of slow. Like I said, they left in a lot of these moments to let the story breathe. Wentworth doesn't even appear on screen until, what, 20 minutes in? Mm -hmm. Something like that. But it still didn't – I had no problem with it. I thought it was great because it's about Anne. Some of the performances were – Yeah, exactly. You do do get a lot of, you know, getting to know Anne. And there are some scenes left in with the children where they put the little boat you know, in the water and to go hip, hip, hooray. I mean, you really do yeah. feel like, you know, Anne, um, and that's, what's important. I mean, that she's, she's the heart and soul of the book. I mean, this is yeah. about, and there's struggle. so many little, oh, there's so many things I love that they did with her in this. Oh, and when she's talking to, um, is Benick the one who was engaged in to Phoebe and she's yes. okay. When they're basically flirting and they're talking about the poetry and she's yeah. just, like, they're having fun, you know? Yeah, and yeah. is not a stick in the mud. Right. She is and clever so many people and witty. Overlook that. Yeah, she is clever and funny and witty. And now I don't remember this being in the book, but it basically before Louisa, you know, takes a header, 
it looks like he's about to propose to her. Oh, well, they def people definitely think that he likes her, but I right. certainly he certainly like never almost proposes. So that's kind of in the movie. Yeah. She kind of set it up where he's like, I have something I need to ask you. And then Louisa does her thing. Yeah. Um, and so again, in the second watch, I was like, Whoa, yeah. maybe he was just going to ask her if he could write to her or something like that. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe. What did you think about that scene? How they shot that versus the 2007, which you found hilarious. Well, they did the slow mo right of her falling, right, and, and they build up the tension by doing all these close up shots of their feet on the narrow steps. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I didn't mind it. It's such a momentous um, occasion thing that happens in the the book. It's at such a turning point. The fact that they went slow mo, they're like, in that moment, everything's about to change. You know, and. God, God, it's got to be hard, especially when you have, I'm sure, a limited budget to have like kind of a stunt person to make it look real because <laughs> that's I pretty serious to take a header into the, the concrete or, I mean, not concrete, but the cob, um, cobblestones maybe. I don't know. I guess um, what I found unsatisfying in both versions is how he failed to catch her. <laughs> it's yeah, still because in, like, because they show him turn around and run. And it's not like she was, I don't know, it felt unsatisfying to me in both versions where it's like he's Daria in the beginning with the volleyball. It's like, just put your arms out and she will just fall on you. you well, know? the weird thing about the Amanda Root version is almost like Louisa does it almost like he, she's not even watching to see if she, he's ready or willing to catch her. She's almost just like, I'm going to jump. And, you know, he's far away. He has to, like, run towards her. You know, he has, he's, yeah. and he goes, Louisa, don't be a fool, and kind of tries to run to catch her. But he's certainly not standing right there with his arms out, you know. And, no. yeah. you know, and those it stairs are kind not of, that large, though. It's not – he wasn't more than three feet away from her. It just – and maybe this is actually a problem with that – as a plot point anyway, the fact that, you know, just the timing was off and like, but you're failing to catch a person. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's unsatisfying to me, both versions, how they do it. Um, I will say that I, they did establish how high up she ran. Yes. It's not like she just dumped from the third step. She like, that was maybe eight and 10 feet in the air. I don't know. It, it would, yeah. it was high. The, um, the 1995, they did a lot of tight shots on people's feet and hands at certain points, mm -hmm. which kind of took me out of the moment more than – I mean, I know what they're trying to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that in that scene, establishing how narrow the stairs were, how high they were, it did add to the tense – the uh, feeling of um, the tenseness of the scene – I'm just not satisfied that neither of those fools could catch that girl. It's like, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, just, just me. I don't know. I was yeah. hoping we'd see some brains. Splatter. Yeah, some brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I thought um, both – were fairly good in showing Anne being like a surgeon and, you know, like taking over the yes, situation. Yes, absolutely. No, no, Benick should go. He knows where to go. Yeah. 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 Um, so I know. I just else? thought it, everything that I liked about the book, I felt that it captured. Yep. Especially with Anne's character. They, they um, both times they took out poor Dick. Dick Musgrove, oh, which yeah. is the right call. Well, again, like these are things that when you're in a book and you can keep track of all these characters, but you just to have another suitor introduced, I felt like it just would have. Those are things that I think with the difference between a book and a movie, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what else? I don't know. I don't. I I just really liked it. I don't really have anything. Highly um, recommend. Oh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. Um, more raving. The part at the end where he comes in to the evening party and they're like, oh, Captain Wentworth, it's so good to see you. And he's like, yes, I'm here about my marriage proposal to Anne. And everyone's <laughs> like, oh, 
<laughs> I loved it because it was because Anne can't do it herself. I mean, yes, they're giving this big awesome moment to a man, blah blah blah, but she can't do it herself. She can't be like, "That's right, bitches." <laughs> Wentworth loves me. He Hi. comes in there and announces it to everyone. I loved it. I was just like clapping my hands. It was so fun, right? Did I you, you also know like yeah. And I, what did you think of when she gets a letter? Okay, so for a filmmaker, it's got to be a struggle, right, to right. have someone read a letter that's the big climax. And so um, what they did was they had him start reading it and her her voice come in as, as she over, continued yeah. to read it as a voiceover, or maybe it was the other way around. Um, and th they were speaking quickly, and I did think it allowed the impact of the letter to come through. And I loved the scene leading up to that when they talk about – uh, you know, the har Harvels um, back and forth with that. I'm so glad they kept that in. And that was a real mm -hmm. loss in the ITV yeah. one. And um, I, I just thought it was done beautifully. I mean, it helped me to visualize and vision, you know, everything. And it was romantic. It really was. I think I would have, I, I, I have no problem with it. I think I would have preferred to have just heard him read the letter and then oh. you see her reaction. But I also had the subtitles on. Mm. So there was a lot going on uh. because it was like the subtitles were on. There were multiple people speaking. I was trying to watch her reaction. If I didn't have the subtitles on, I think it maybe would have had more impact. Um, but I thought his reading of the letter was so beautiful that when it started to fade out, I was like, but no, wait, wait. Um, By the way, I got to say, too, I will admit that he is a handsome man, Kieran Hines. I came around. Yes, I, he's very I, handsome in that movie. Handsome, you know, I, I, certainly he doesn't look like Man's Raider. <laughs> you know, yeah, he wears there. that uniform very well, too. Yeah, he does. And, you know, they are a little I had an eye for a uniform in my day. <laughs> <laughs> I liked a red coat, red, red coat well enough. Uh, I mean, and I do but, yeah. steal in my heart. But, um. Yeah. What was I going to say? What was I going to say? They're a little older than they necessarily would have been in the book, which is fine. I wonder yeah. if that's because they wanted her or they wanted him. Do you know what I mean? For the role, the actors? Oh. Well, and it's also too like um, people, modern day people wouldn't understand their chronology in which she's 27 or 28 and really is like a spinster. Because um, she would look yeah, and it's like, like, girl, young you woman. Don't need to be Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I thought that was fine, too. I thought they were both, um, you know, still believable and everything. Did you think that Sir Walter and Elizabeth were over the top? You know what? what? I didn't think they were over the top. Well, they were a little over the top. However, I didn't hate that um, because they are such caricatures in the book. Um, I really enjoyed that he was a ginger um, for whatever reason. I, I enjoyed never... his costumes, actually. Yeah, he... Yeah, he was, he was funny. such like a dandy. It was yeah. great. I thought that Elizabeth was kind of – they always had her eating. Yeah. If you notice, which I thought was a really nice choice. Um, to me, it was a little – but like you said, I mean, they are basically caricatures in the book. They are a source of comedy and awfulness. Um, I thought that the guy who played Sir Walter did a really good job. Yeah, he did. And um, I didn't hate Elizabeth. I liked how um, like she would have these little tantrums, which yeah. because they didn't have a lot of time to develop her character and she doesn't have a lot of screen screen time, it did make her seem spoiled and selfish. So and cruel to Anne, too. So yeah. cruel. To yeah. Anne. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and normally, like in the book, you can't imagine why she would be so cruel to Anne. But in the, you know, in the movie, you can see this temperament come out where she's just... Um, you know, a basic bitch. <laughs> and, it also is, and it seems weird because she is the eldest and at least in the book, she's regarded as the most beautiful. But I feel like the actress playing her, there's also a lot of jealousy because mm -hmm. Anne was thought of, thought of well by Lady Russell and people like that. And her opinion mattered. Like with the retrenching, it's like, Anne, why would you talk to her? Not so yeah. much as like, well, Anne's an idiot, but like, why does <laughs> Anne get consulted? Yeah. And I don't. Yeah, almost you know? like the jealousy of the attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a little moment that I noticed the second time where Anne, um, oh, what is her name? Mrs. Clay and Elizabeth are like eating something, macaroons, I don't remember. They're eating <laughs> something in the shop and it starts to rain. 
And Mr. Elliot's like, oh, I've got the carriage, but it will only carry two. And Elizabeth is like, oh, Anne will walk. And then Mrs. Clay says, oh, no, you know, I don't mind walking. And she kind of fights. And I remember yeah. thinking, why would she – oh, my God, she wants Mr. Elliot to walk her home. Yep. Yep. <gasps> yep. Yep. <laughs> I just noticed it. It was a really nice, subtle bit of work that you would catch your repeat viewing. Like I would not – I did not catch it even the first time, even knowing how it ends. Um, I didn't catch it with the, with the first read-through of the book at all. I didn't yeah, catch but it. Yeah, but it was a really nice moment that they included um, as just like a little subtle hint at what's to come. Yeah, it, it, was, it was good. And um, before I and forget, living I want to make this – Living up. things in like that – I think yeah. is what shows these filmmakers really understood the book. Yeah. And Austin's little things mean a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially in this story, little gestures and little actions mean a lot, but that's true all of, of Austin. But I really wanted to say, I really liked Charles Musgrove in the, this adaptation. Oh, me too. Yes. He was great. He was, he was great. I could see him and Anne being very happily married. Yeah, I love him. I love him as a character. He yeah. is is fun, and I know like he wasn't, as they say, like um, not really bookish. And it says like the narrator in the book says like Anne could have really elevated him and made him like a thinking man. Yeah. And I almost grieve for him that he has to be married to Mary. Mary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although you have I mean, to acknowledge I he did have the insight to ask Anne first. Yes, which makes he it did even sadder. She was more, yeah. It makes but it even sadder. And I wonder if her being around, um, taking care of Mary or whatever, um, it's weird because it's not awkward between them at all where she apparently turned down his proposal. So I don't yeah. know how strong he really felt about her, whether he was really in love or not. I'm, I'm thinking no because it's not awkward for them to be around each other. Um, but but I the do. the quality of their characters. Yes. And he's just an amiable guy. You yeah, know, I've seen that actor in other things, and he is always just extremely likable. <laughs> and so I think he was a great choice for like yeah. this. And oh my gosh, and they left in a thing where he's like, "Oh, Wentworth, you know, could you walk in? Because I got to see yeah. the guy about the gun." And yeah. I'm like, "Yes, yes." Oh yeah, my gosh, yeah, just he just—I don't know. I, I just—I'm glad you mentioned that because I remember thinking, "I really am enjoying Charles Musgrove. He just seems like a good guy." He's a good guy. He's a good dude. Yeah. And it makes sense for Wentworth to always be hanging around there because yeah. you can see how fun and how fun Charles it really is and how they love to go shooting together and he's a good guy, blah, blah, blah. And when Louisa mentions, you know, oh, we all wish that Anne had married him instead of Mary when he asked, it it kind of gives you even more like, yes, and when Wentworth is like, Charles, that's Anne. Um, not yeah. only is he kind of jealous or like he then has insight into that she turned him down. She still feels strongly about him or, you know, Mrs. Russell convinced her. But he respects Charles. Yeah. And so he even knows that it's, you know, it wasn't just him that recognizes and Her value. Yeah. Qualities. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I just really, I mean, I would buy this movie. I probably will and watch yeah. it multiple times. It will get into regular Austin rotation. If I was in that universe, I'd marry Charles. And hey, I would do a lot. I would be a better wife than Mary. Charles, oh, pick totally. me. Pick me, Charles. Pick me, Charles. <laughs> I who I would marry. Um, I'm trying to think of the – Charles is actually kind of the best dude in this. Other, I mean, we're going to say like not Wentworth because obviously we don't want to break up him and Anne. Right. Um, Harville and – Bennick are both kind of, yeah. I don't know. They're both very sad. Not inspiring. <laughs> yeah. I, hope that, I yeah. do hope that Louisa, like, he, she, after her brain gets addled or however Admiral Croft puts it, <laughs> he says something about her like, oh, well, after her brain has settled or something. Yeah, like it's that. put to rights. Her brain must be put right, to rights. Yeah. Yeah, I f he was so depressed, but she was kind of like so rambunctious. Maybe the two of them will then pull each other to the middle. Yeah. Then it's nice. So, yeah. So, anything yeah, else? Loved it. Loved it. So, in 2007, it. hated it. 1995, <laughs> loved it. <laughs> That's our Cisco capital review. Fruit, we're like two thumbs up, two thumbs down. I was yeah. thinking, yeah, I was thinking more in living color. 
the two guys. Um, but sure, Siskel and Ebert, yeah. Yeah. Wait, am I Ebert? Oh, well, he was awesome, so whatever. <laughs> See you at the Happy movies. <laughs> See you at the movies. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, um, Sorry. Well, I can't really think of anything else we need to cover. I think that we've gushed appropriately. Yep. So we can uh, – do you want to go to the Wee Chief? Let's go to the Wee Chief. Let's we need to have some jaunty music play, right? Like yeah, we do. I mean, frolic down the lane. Well, let's find some like public domain Austin era, like. I mean, we always say yes. we will, and then we never do because we have actual yeah, lives. Well, and when when you say we say we will, and we never do, you mean Kristen says she will, and she never does. No, we are equal partners, and by <laughs> equal partners, I mean you do all the work. Um, <laughs> But I can take some self-responsibility for this, too. All right, um, you find maybe, something. Maybe one of our amazing listeners is a musician. <laughs> maybe. Um, well, right. and uh, I don't know if we're going to talk, mention this idea of this contest or not. And I don't even know if we have enough fans to make this, like, legit. But I think we need some new cover art. So <laughs> yeah. if anyone's interested in doing that, I'm too lazy to do it and too busy to do it. I like our cover art, though. Wait, do you mean the cover art of our podcast cover where it's our disembodied heads on yeah. the, uh, women's bodies? I like it. Yeah. Well, we could have different cover art for different – like, we could have different cover art for each episode. Like, I don't know if you remember, like, for the North thing or Abby one, you put, I put the vampire, vampire teeth in. Back. Yeah, that was cute. <laughs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I think still really glad – I did that. I think I'm we really should keep glad that cover art until it no longer looks like us. Give it like 10 years <laughs> so when we we're all like cool. haggard. <laughs> um, well, all we need is a brisk wind. To How be about this, again. Kristen? How about this? Next time you and I are together, we will take a photo that we can use. Because that was you using Photoshop of some older, like different photo, separate photographs of us. Yeah, on Facebook. I just like right. grabbed some facebook photos so what if because hopefully we will be together at some point this year so why don't we try to make sure that we take an actual like cool photo yeah let's do it well and you i don't know if you are planning to go alone to jasna in huntington beach i, I still am up yes gentle listeners um the jane austen society of north america their annual conference this year is in huntington beach california which interestingly enough is about two miles where my brother lives um, in Torrance, California. And we didn't get to go last year when it was in Washington, D.C., where I live because I was out of the country. So I'm giving um, a lot of thought to going to it in October um, in California. And honestly, it's going to probably come down to um, money. But I I'd like and to go. I don't think I can go. It's like for a lot of reasons and a lot of family stuff going on at the beginning of October. Oh, no. But – you could always go with like, um, I don't know, or like meet up with a podcast listener. Maybe you could do yeah. a podcast with like a guest podcaster or something down there. I was thinking it would be really fun to do a podcast if we were there together. Um, if anyone is planning to go to Jasna, shoot us a note and let us know because um, if I knew that some of our listeners were going to be there, it would definitely be more incentive for me to go. Um, yeah, hang out with Maggie. I don't mind going by myself. Uh, that's fine with me. I have no problem. Um, but it would be cool if I knew I could meet up with some of you guys. So that would be fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. So I hope that happens. And um, another thing we should mention is that we got another email from our fan, Louise, who is the biggest Persuasion fan. And she um, has a recommendation for everybody um, where – she actually was talking about Mr. Elliot and, you know, uh, what a piece of work that character is. And apparently there's an author who has um, written what happens to Mr. Elliot. And it's called oh. the, De the Deception at Lyme. And the Ooh. author's name is uh, Car Car Hi, oh my Suki. God, sorry. I'm going to just wait for her to stop. <laughs> She's so cute. Kevin's coming home apparently. Yay! Oh my gosh, I'm going to bark too. I'm so excited. I love it when Kevin comes <laughs> in. Um, so, uh, oh, the author's name is Carrie Bebris, and the book's name is The Deception at Lyme, and apparently she's also written Mr. and Mrs. Darcy Mysteries. Um, so Ooh. Check, check that out. 
Sounds awesome. Um, she also sent a very interesting article over, which we will post on the Facebook page as well. And I guess you got um, a message as well from a fan. I did. Uh, we got a Facebook message uh, from a fan in New Zealand, which made me very excited. And her name is Donna, not Dana. She made it very clear. Americans pronounce it Dana, but please say Donna. So hopefully I'm saying it correctly. Um, thank you so much for your message. I loved receiving it. So did Kristen. We love hearing from you guys. It was very kind, full of praise. Um, we're so happy when you guys reach out and make contact. A lot of a common theme of um, a lot of the things that we get um, is, you know, oh, I had to work up the nerve to message you, or I didn't have anything clever to say. You do not need to say something clever. You, it's low. Um, Stress Those stakes <laughs> to email or message us. Seriously, we are just happy. Just say hi. We love hearing from you guys. You kind of sometimes feel like you're shouting in the ether. So it's always nice to hear from you. Please feel yeah. free to reach out. Um, but Donna sent us a very interesting question that she thought we could answer. Um, she sent it just to answer in the message, but I thought that I would ask on air because I want to hear what Kristen has to say. She wanted to know which Jane Austen hero is closest to your perfect match and which Jane Austen heroine do you also feel you relate to most? So kind of the hero and the heroine. So Kristen, what do you think? Of the, so of the heroes, which one would be your perfect match? So hard. What do you think? What, what do you think? Oh. I mean, J.J. Field, obviously. <laughs> oh, wait. I'm sorry. He's a real person. Um, <laughs> um, what is his character's name in Northanger Abbey? Kristen, remind me. Uh, Tilney. Mr. Henry Tilney. Tilney. Obvi. It would be Henry Obvi. Tilney. Yeah, because I got to have I, someone who's a total goober. I would, say, I would say that the right answer for happiness would be Henry Tilney. Um, and I did, in fact, marry a similar guy. Uh, in temperament, I, I feel. But um, honestly, as far as the super crush goes, like the guy I like that I shouldn't like would be Darcy. I am a sucker for getting negged. And mm -hmm. uh, to, be, <laughs> to be honest, um, I write, happen to, you know, do some fiction writing myself and all of my protagonists, my male protagonists, are kind of jerks, <laughs> which yeah. is bad, but definitely a thing that some women just find cat like cat now. I, um, as far as a heroine goes, definitely in my younger days, Fanny Price, I definitely have an affinity mm. for her. But these days, I really feel like an Elizabeth Bennett, and I hope that's true. So, uh, my for the heroine, I would say Lizzie because I kind of pride myself on having a snappy response and being able to move easily within society and talk to all different types of people and yes. not have that kind yes. of awkwardness. But with a core of Eleanor Dashwood, <laughs> nice. because I, if something needs to be done, I get in there and get it done. <laughs> It's like, oh, no, Margaret, this thing has happened. I'm like, let's fix this. <laughs> let's do it. Like, what do we need to do? This is what we're going to do. Boom. I go into planning mode. Um, and so that's one of the things I actually really admire and hope that I share with Eleanor. Um, just want to say about Mr. Darcy. Uh, Mr. Darcy is obviously would be the most popular choice, you know, because he is the romantic hero, I think that Austin will be remembered for forever with good reason. I think that being married to Darcy would be exhausting. Yeah, I think she, I think she even somehow though, I, but Darcy before the marriage would be, unless you could be Elizabeth and sort of help him because he needs to be helped. I mean, and I think he wants to be helped. He wants to you change. Know what? Ain't nobody got time for that. I don't know. I'm I just, love it. I love guys oh. who sort of, curmudgeonly or mean but they have a heart of gold you know like yeah. that's just my catnip I guess kind of nightly in a, in a way but I really hate being condescended to honestly yeah he does that to her a lot and I think right. the age difference yeah 
has a lot. But I mean, Mr. Knightley come is very the age difference is kind of the big thing with Knightley. I think Knightley would respond would when Emma is older after they have been married, Knightley I think will be very different. If that makes sense. Yes. I don't know. I think that one of the things I love about Pride and Prejudice, which not to blow our Pride and Prejudice wad, <laughs> is that Darcy does actually change through the book. He doesn't mm-hmm. change for Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. He changes as a result of the self-realization he has because of his interactions with her. Yes. They both change – if people because who are willing they, to change and grow in response to yes. things being revealed to them is just such an attractive quality. Like people who are willing to apologize. People who are looking right. to evolve as people and trying, you know, to to be their right. best selves. There is nothing so attractive to me. And it's it's not like yeah. I'm going to try to be a better person because I love you, you know. But it's like he truly mm-hmm. does have self. He truly changes He's, not because yeah. I don't know how do I say this not be. It's not really because of his love for her. It's through it. Yes. Maybe. But I fundamentally have a problem with this whole I can I love this guy and I can change him. Change him. him. Yes. That's that not- kind of narrative drives me absolutely insane. Um and I don't think that Darcy, by the time by the end of Pride and Prejudice, yes, he has changed. But let's just say, gentle listeners, you and I both know that there is work to be done. Well, she even honestly, says. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I would have. I'd be like, Ugh, the energy. <laughs> she even says he has yet to be learned to learn to be laughed at. So going forward, she knows that that's going to be a task on her shoulders is to teach him to. Uh, it's okay to be teased and ridiculed a little bit. You know and how to do is, that in a yeah. loving fashion. And this is probably a factor of being. 16 years older than Elizabeth? What if she's not yet one in 20? So she's 20? Yeah. Well, he's only like, what Yeah, but when you get to be older, it's just like, by the time you get to be this age, honey, you need to know. I hope this makes sense, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, to me, it would just be exhausting. It's just like, you know what? You need, you're an adult. You're a man, act like it. I don't have time I love, to teach you. How I'm to always laugh attracted at to this idea of um, I'm going to come into your life and fill um, an emotional need and just come mm. in and finally understand you when nobody else understands you and love you. And, you know, when nobody else loves you and show you that you're worthy of love and below. Because I think part of Darcy's problem is that he has fundamental insecurity. And so yeah, for her to come absolutely. in and just soothe that is just really something that yeah. I mean. I, yeah, and that's a good point. It's just not it, – but that's not the same thing as – that's just the nature of kind of who she is as a person rather than something that he needs to be taught. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's I'm very being too hard. Question. Maybe I'm being too hard on Darcy. It'll be interesting to reread. No, it's just not your thing. Of- it's just – No, it's not your thing. I don't think you're being too hard on him. I just think your personal preference is not there. He is – Tilney – I respond extremely well to Tilney because he is so funny. And he he is like the male Lizzie, right? I think we said that when we talked about Northanger Abbey. And to me, that is just something that I'm on board for. He's (laughs) funny. He's clever. He jokes. But he can be serious and he's smart and he, you know, helps run that estate. But he cracks jokes, you know? He understands that life is not kind of the serious thing all the time. <laughs> when and, our I mean, listener – oh, go ahead. Darcy will learn that, just not from me. <laughs> <laughs> One of our listeners, Veronica, who we men- have mentioned before – I don't think I've said this on the podcast, but she was talking about her husband – I think husband – um, and uh, said that he's – this is so funny to me, and I, I will never forget it. She said that he's a bizarre nesting doll of um, Mr. Bingley on the inside and Mr. Palmer on the outside. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. There is a lot to unpack there, and especially with the nesting doll metaphor. Very nice. Wow. <laughs> Which so I adore. Inside, he's the kindest, most gentle, positive, positive person. Positive. And outside, he's like this 
sardonic, sarcastic. Is she Lori? Kind of, yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? That's actually how you could describe me. Oh, <laughs> no. You're a big old teddy bear. You, you're a kid. Yeah, well, that's the thing, though. But sometimes I, this is the thing. That's why I hesitate to actually relate myself too well to Lizzie. And I, I mentioned this in like one of our very first episodes that sometimes I do cross that line that she doesn't where I do make a joke that is mean. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to. Um, but sometimes my attempt to be humorous um, can be mean. And it's one of the things I actually don't like about myself and try to work on. Um, so I actually really – when she says – Mr. Bingley nested Mr. Palmer. I absolutely get that. <laughs> Although Mr. Palmer is really mean. Yeah, he can be very mean. Is she saying then that she's like Mrs. Palmer? Is that, I can't be no. right. <laughs> no, I don't think she's extending it, the metaphor that far. <laughs> God, I, I really don't think she's saying that about herself. Yeah. But that was um, a great, uh, great listener question. Yeah, thanks thank you so question. much. That was really fun to think about. Yeah. I mean, we can just all agree that J.J. Field as Mr. Tilney is the best of all time. Yeah. It's yeah. my takeaway, at least. Yes. Yes, he is. I mean, don't he get me wrong, Colin Firth, love, 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 helped usher me into puberty. <sighs> um, but J.J. Field is just so awesome. He's so great. This is the fangirl portion of the podcast. I completely agree with J.J. Field. <laughs> Uh, he's like catnip. I mean, that's the reason we go back to that adaptation again and again. To be honest, is that the well, great there's other things that we can point to about it. But yeah, he he is. He, he makes is it fantastic. So Do you know, I was watching. Uh, sorry, uh, and you can take this out if you want. But I'm just going to say that uh, Captain America: The First Avenger was on the other day, and sometimes I forget that he is actually in it. He yes. is one of the oh god, what are they called? The Howling something. I can't remember. Basically, his little like gang. Um, yeah. he's got that adorable beret. Yeah, but he has a mustache too, doesn't he? Oh my God, the mustache! Oh. <laughs> you do love facial hair. Oh, I do. You know, usually I, I appreciate the mustache um, mostly for comedic value these days because it's kind of hard <laughs> to rock that look. But he looks good with a mustache, I will say. Yeah. Give me a work. All right. So another uh, listener uh, that we have to talk about is, um, and I wish I had asked her now how to pronounce her first name. I just assumed I knew how to pronounce it. But uh, Lana, L-O-N-A, Lana, um, Lana Manning is, uh, you may have seen on the Facebook page, but if you don't follow us on Facebook, we have a listener named Lana Manning. She is a self-published author. She has written a uh, Mansfield Park uh, sequel. Or Yay. it's not a sequel. No, it's not a sequel. It is an alternate uh, telling of the story where Fanny Price um, – it runs away to become a governess. Burns down and Mansfield Park. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would be awesome, right? <laughs> and um, I, uh, I personally have bought her book. I because of a long story um, involving my Kindle and my phone. Blah blah blah. I haven't finished it. However, I am not a reader of Austin uh, sequels or whatever. I do not read them as a rule. Um, I, I, you know, I bought it. I was like, you know, I'm going to support her. I understand how hard it is to be a self-published author. And I was reading it and I, I really, really was enjoying it. Um, and highly recommended, extremely well-written, extremely clever. I thought the way she incorporated details from the original Mansfield Park. I don't know where the story is going, but, um, check it out on Facebook or just search for her on Amazon. Uh, the name of the book is A Contrary Wind. And Ooh. she's a lot of money. Check it out. Yeah, I love how creative our listeners are. And, you know, we yeah. shared other things um, from our listeners. And, I mean, I think I speak for Kristen that we are more than happy to give you a shout out if you have something like that. Because I, I'm just so impressed by everyone who is able to produce, whether it's your Etsy shop or you know of an Etsy shop yes. we'd like or you write a book, which is like – birthing a child as far as I'm concerned. Um, it is. I think it's amazing. So let it give us a heads up and we'll give you a shout out. Awesome. Okay. Anything else? I don't know. I feel like we I think that's it. A lot on this that's one. I think we're good. I'm trying to think of anything else to add. Now I'm just thinking about Henry Tilney. Ah, dreamy um, JJ oh, Field. He knows so much about okay. Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, girl. Well, Thanks All right, for listening, everyone. everybody. 
And, uh, you know, talk to you next time. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, wait what are we wait. talking about next time? Oh. Silence. I don't know. I don't know. What should we talk about next time, Kristen? We only have one more novel you... left. But I feel like maybe we should come uh, up with something else before we dive into Pride and Prejudice. Do you want to read the Jane Austen Book Club, the book, the Jane Austen Book Club? Oh, you know what? That's not a bad idea. Sure. So we'll take I, read it, I read it a long time ago. Um, and I've seen the movie a long time ago. We can read the book and see the movie and then do a – uh, yeah, you know what we're doing now, though we are we are like the 2007 Persuasion movie where everyone wants to get to the kiss, everyone wants to get to Pride and Prejudice, and we are just like teasing and drawing <laughs> it out. <laughs> well, I thought that when you come out, that's when we wanted to do Pride and Prejudice, so that we could like marathon it or whatever. Oh yeah, wow, that's a good idea. Except who knows when that would be? I don't know if we can put this off until like August or whenever yeah. it is. If I can get my bunch yeah, of boys. That's true. That's true. Um, so I think that's a great idea. Let's talk about the Jane Austen Book Club next. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Okay. See you guys. All right. Next Thanks, time. everyone. All right. Bye.